So hi everyone. Today I'm with Ready Ready Rival. I was thinking I'm crazy for taking a fight. But me, my job, my couple of my team, we all bleeding at each other. We knew what we could do. Went out there, did the business, you know what I mean? And the rest is history. AKA Akeem Ennis Brown, the English champion, European champion, uh, WBC youth world champion. And we're going to be having a chat about his life and career today. So, uh, really, thank you for you know taking the time to have a chat with me today, mate. I appreciate that. Yeah, man, nice one, man. Thank you, bro. That's good, man. How you been, bro? Long time no see, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's good, man. <laughs> been, yeah, it's been too long, isn't it? Because it was, what was it? Cardiff was the last one, wasn't it? Cardiff, we been... Cardiff. We've done a lot of work together in Cardiff um, over the build up for that fight. Um, yeah. Props to Liam, doing, doing good things, man. You're moving up in the world now as well, man. Nah, it's good, man. It's good, good yeah. to see your progress on that. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, just keeping at it, you know, trying to move up the levels and, uh, you know, do yeah, my best. Good, like, yeah, thank you, man. Thank you. Cool, man. So, you know, I mean, yeah, let's let's start at the beginning, shall we, really? I mean, obviously, in, you know, in 13 fights that you've had, um, you know, all, already winning, you know, three major titles, uh, you're moving mountains. Um, let's start with, with the English title, shall we? I mean, tell us a little bit about that fight um, and how, you know, how your preparations for that fight and how the actual fight went, just to get the ball rolling, OK? All right, so the English, um, where was that? That was a good, what was that, 2017? That was like, looking like three years ago, the English. So, yeah. um, basically, I must have been, I've just basically before, a couple months before that, I won. I fighted Freddie Kewitt in an English eliminator. So, I won that. Um, I was expected to get a shot. Well, I, I thought I could get a shot straight away after winning that fight. Went to a fight with Freddie Kewitt. He was 11 and 0. I think I only had six fights at the time. That's my seventh fight. Beat him. I was a highly underdog. So after winning that fight, I thought, cut up the English limit and get the English title shot straight away. What I clocked is boxing don't work like that. You know what I mean? Like, there's obviously people who want to, the good promoters and stuff like that, people where the money they can get in before you. So when I was waiting for my promoter at the time, um, uh, put it to the board to basically argue my rights to fight, where he was diddly daddling, taking along with that. Um, I think, who went into fight next? I think it ended up being. Philip Bowles and Chris, no, Philip Bowles. I think it ended when Joe Hughes fighted Andy Keats and then it's been vacated and then Philip Bowles fighted Glenn Foot. So then obviously at that point of time, I knew my, I'm going to be next or I should be next, whatever to fight. So I expected to be thinking, every saying Philip Bowles was a highly favourite to win that fight. So I didn't really know much about Glenn Foot at that time. I did, probably didn't. So um, my eyes, my attention was on Philip Bowles winning the fight. Anyway, Glenn Foot won the fight, you know what I mean? Went to Philip Bowles' hometown, beat him become the new English uh, champion. So I kind of seen that fight a bit like, he's obviously going to do what he's going to do. Like, there's no real ties with them that's far away, whatever. At the time, where I was looking at English, I thought like, you know what? I'm probably not going to get my shot straight away. I kind of lowered my, dropped back down with my expectation to like seven area. I thought, you know what? Let me target seven area. Who's the target seven area? Even though I won an English limit, I feel like I'm there. Maybe i got to do something else. I'll just go get the seven area title. So at the time, I think, I think Sierra Osgoes was champion at the time. So I was kind of mean him with having a bit of back and forth on social media, whatever. So I was looking, trying to get a fight with him. His team wasn't really trying to have the fight. You know what I mean, they were trying to look on for the English so, or look on other stuff. And then while we'd have a lot of back and forth on social media, I remember just being on social media one day, coming across there. And I think Sierra Osgoes and Glenn Foot was in an argument, you know what I mean, on social media. So they'd have a back and forth trying to like, and I've seen Sierra Osgoes trying to make the fight with Glenn Foot right there and then, like saying, that's why the, the, I'm coming next to the. And right through so, Sierra Oakwood probably would have been next in line because he was Southern Area champion, whatever, at the time. But I feel like from what I'd done and fighting English, um, winning the English limited, whatever, I felt like, nah, I'm, I'm, I should be right in front. So I just kind of jumped in in the argument and said to them, but I said, listen, like, you know what, I'll fight you, you know what I mean? Like, what they're bittering about our fighting and they're saying, oh, you take this much, whatever. I'm just like, I'll fight. And then I'm saying, you know what, I even take less than that guy to fight right now. You can have all this. I don't even care. Give me the shot, I'll fight, you know what I mean? So obviously, um, we made the fight. Um, my team, I got my team to MTK to make the fight with their team. I just said, listen, I don't even care. I just want a title, so I got to do the biz. They managed to make the the, the fight. Obviously, everybody suspected it to be like, uh, I'm guessing from Glenfoot's team, they would have said, listen, take the fight. It's gonna be good money. You can look good in front of your hometown, defending your English, your new English title against a guy who's don't really look like he can hit. Don't know much about him, but he only had like what eight fights at the time. You know what I mean? So. You know what I mean? You, it's an easy fight to look good against. Like, at this time, Glenn Foote, you got things probably had about, I think he had like 21 fights, 120 of them, you know what I mean? So, once again, everybody's thinking, I'm crazy for taking a fight. 
but me, my job, my couple of my team, we all believed in each other. We knew what we could do. Went out there, did the business, you know what I mean? And the rest is history. You touched on something there, really. I mean, that's, that I think is important because going into a lot of the fights that you've had, you know, you've been the underdog and you've been like a lot of times, you know, you've been sort of written off and stuff by a lot of people. I know you have a lot of support as well, but I mean, there's a lot of the boxing people saying, oh, you're taking this fight too soon, this, that and the other. But obviously you always, you always pull it off. Like, you know what I mean? I mean, you, you yeah, always yeah. pull it off and, and in style as well. So, I mean, yeah. how do you handle like the mental um, sort of, do you feel any pressure or do you just sort of just do your thing? Uh, mental side of it, it's like nah, not really. Like the pressure, it's a it's a weird thing. It's like the, it, it's weird for you to say. Like every act of pressure, do you feel pressure? Do you feel nerve? Do you feel this? What do you feel? What goes through your head? Like ah, you're crazy. For me, it's like all right, you're only human, so everybody feels nerves, yeah. But it's like you got to define yourself. What is nerves? Like nerves can be good or bad. It depends how you use them. That's what I was taught from a real young age. You know what I mean, like I was taught like nerves, pressure, all that stuff. Like it's all the same thing, yeah. And all it is is excitement. It's the same thing as being excited. You know what I mean? Excited, nerves, everything, pressure, same thing. And the way to look at it is like it's fire, you know? With fire, you can have a use fire to make it useful for you. Or you, if you don't use it right, it can burn, you know? So when I look, put that aspect in, and it's true, like any fight I've gone into, I don't feel no nerves. I don't feel no pressure. I don't feel no excitement. No, like you're not feeling your belly, like, yeah, like, even I don't feel that, but I have the worst performances, like, I mean, not worse, like, bad, but it's just poor, like, boring, like, I'm not entertained, you know. The minute I go in there, I got a bit of nerves or whatever you want to call it, butterfly. And when I say nerves, nerves are never scared for me, like, it's not that, it's just that little butterfly excitement feelings where, you know, what I mean, like, yeah, you, you feel alive, ready to do this. When I get that, I have my best performances. So, like I said, it, it sticks to that same point, it's like fire, it depends how you use it. So, mm, yeah, it's always good, man, nerves are good. Yeah, yeah. Just curious, man, because I remember, like, you know, before the European and stuff, uh, we was talking and stuff, and you seemed so chilled out, man. I was like, I was like, whoa, you know, he's he's going into this big. So I was just curious. But before we get to that, obviously, um, the, you know, the WBC, the youth um, world title and stuff like that. And I know I've skipped over uh, like a few fights there, but that's obviously yeah. so far. That's one of your biggest, yeah. um, your biggest career highlights and stuff. Very good win over Chris Jenkins. Obviously, gone on to become British champion and everything. Um, yeah. Talk us through a little bit about that fight. I mean, how did it feel to win like a, like a big title like that? Yeah, man. Um, Chris Jenkins fighting him. Uh, that that fight was even a funny one because it's like same thing. We could touch on what we said about the nerves, that sighted feeling, that pressure type of feeling. Yeah. So all right. So first time fight. No, not my first time. Like I had a couple of fights in my hometown before, but more lower level. You know, small local show type of thing. This like first. I'm going to be a headline, bring a big title fight where we are on boxing in Gloucester for a little while. And the whole aim was it to bring, make it like the whole title of the whole show was the biggest boxing event ever. You know what I mean? Like history, like ever in Gloucester. So um, me, I had that target. So it's like, I'm thinking, all right, so I've got to start the show, make the show, do the show, give it a big, everything, money's worth for it. And then when it comes to fighting, because it was a vacant title at the time, obviously I got a couple of opponents put in front of me who you could pick. So I could have picked out a couple of opponents. And I looked at him, I'm thinking, I don't want that guy. That guy got a losing record. That guy got a losing record. That looks like, you know what I mean? Obviously, I know I can roll over that guy. None of these guys that got lit given to me was like, you're your boxing man, you know boxing. Yes, the average person probably don't know, but you know. If I put the list of guys in front of you, you would think, uh, you know what I mean? It's not wet in your lips like as a fight. So that now for me, and the same thing for me, I wasn't getting entertained or up for it. So I said to my team, I said, if, I'm, if we're going to do this here, we need like some something proper, like something where. I shouldn't win. Same thing like all the rest of the fights. You know what I mean? That's what people come to see. They want to see if I can. Can really, really do it? So then they put through two other guys. One guy, I can't remember the guy, he's like a foreigner, but he's good, but weren't really known. And they put through Chris Jenkins. And I was like, all right, cool. Um, and I, I didn't know much about Chris Jenkins at the time. I didn't really know that coming. So I just said, like, ask some other people, you know, and then a couple people just said, if you beat him, uh, you'll be, you'll be, you know, you'll be the man. But personally, I wouldn't take the fight. Like, I wouldn't take the fight. A lot of people talk to John Pittman saying, I want to put none of my boys against him, you know what I mean? But if Riddy does it, you know what I mean? It would make it would be a good shout, you know what I mean? Like I said, that's all I need to hear. Good shout, yeah. Make the fight, you know? So got the fight made. At the same time, a lot of people are thinking once again, like, wow, like is really doing this? Like but in my head it's like I know how you know I know how good I am. It don't matter how good the other guy is, I know how good I am and I know how hard I'm gonna work in camp, how hard and how I know how bad I want it. So it doesn't really matter, like I know what I'm going to do when it comes down to showtime. And that was another thing. It was just literally a chance for me to be in front of my hometown, 
pick up another title, but instead of just looking good, I need to showcase my skills to my hometown to show like, yo, this is what I've been doing for the last couple of years. I can't show that against someone who's going to just roll over and die. You know what I mean? So Chris Jenkins was a perfect opponent and it showed that, you know what, I'm on a different level. And since then, everything started to fast forward movement, you know? And then, I mean, that, that, that touches on, uh, well, actually, let's talk about the European first and then we'll, a few other things. So the European title uh, obviously come quite soon after the, the WBC um, youth. And, and you, like you were saying, you're fast tracking, uh, in, but in the right type of way, you know, taking the biggest fights. What, what sort of happened with that fight? Because I remember, again, it was the same type of thing. People saying, oh, it's too soon for, for, for European. Obviously, you did the business and you've defended, obviously, since then. So what, what sort of happened around, like, around that fight? Well, even with that, it's like, you say it's fast track, like you said, it's fast track. It in a good way. A it has been like a bit, yeah, it has been a fast track in a way of like, like I've had the title to hard fight, like in a quick succession, but it, the way I would want it to be a lot quicker as well, you know what I mean? Like, and it yeah. should have been like, so after the WC Youth World, uh, well, that Chris Jenkins fight, um, I had fights for like Sky Sports, I'd been a fight on the Joker, Dina Undercard, like straight after that, a couple months after that, that fight fell through because of a foreign opponent. Then I was going to be on the Mayor Con, MTK got me a shot on the Mayor Con Undercard. Like a month after that fight, um, the Joe Cordino one fell through. That fight fell through. So it was like at the time, right then, then for that whole summer or that whole period after the Chris Jenkins fight, I was thinking, what? Like, I want to be active. Like, I just did all that big fight, had the biggest fight of my career. Nothing ain't happening. Because on to MTK, like, get me anything. You know what I mean? They'd get me different names. The amount of opponents they'd get me at a time, like, whereas, like, they were so much above and they should have took the fight, but no one didn't want to take the fight. It's like no one didn't want to take the risk this time. No one ain't falling for it. Like, there were foreign opponents, top opponents, you know what I mean? Like, good, so many good, like, level class A opponents here, what was just saying now, they're not turning down the fight. So I like to indicate anybody, give me anybody, I'm ready to just, just destroy anybody. And then we've been a fight, I think it's going to be Johnny Quill. I think it's Johnny Quill, I think, yeah, Johnny Quill, we've been a fight. So then, they're like, you two fight each other, it's a make or break fight for whoever wins, pushes on. I'm thinking, I don't mind, like, I like Johnny Quill, you know what I mean? Johnny Quill's cool, but it's got to be what it is, business, you know? So, I'd already get it on. I think John, Johnny Cole at the time, Johnny Cole at the time wasn't um, willing to, I don't think he wanted to do the fight. I don't think the money was right for him, as, as he said, you know what I mean? He felt like, for me, it was a big, I was too much of a risk for the the money what it was worth. And that's fair enough, that's understandable for him. Like, he, Johnny Cole's been around a bit longer than me, so if he felt like his dues was a bit more than that, then fair enough. And I wouldn't fight me for dud money neither, you know? Like, so, I understood that. And that at the time I was a bit annoyed because I was thinking I wanted to Johnny Cole was a good name, so I wanted to showcase what I could do against a good name. But then at the same time it was good because they come through with the Dar Foley fight. So like, I got a text like you got Dar Foley, this guy wanna fight him. And I remember watching Dar Foley before because he fighted Chris Jenkins after me. So it was a chance to see what Chris Jenkins was about again after fighting me or whatever. And that fight didn't really go too far. So I didn't really get to see enough about Dar Foley. But there was this like big mysterious hype over him about the guy what MTK like put a lot of money in, got him over from Sydney, Australia, wherever he is from, you know what I mean? Got him over, uh, got love. There's a big, like, mysterious hype out. So I was like, I'm thinking, I don't mind that. Like, I mean, give me that guy in there. I'll take that. Like, so uh, once again, there, like, he's ranked world, a fifth in the world, did this, got all these titles from abroad, big old mysterious hype. To me, that, I just think that's just all talk, you know, all hype. Like, uh, when he's in the ring, is that all going to do anything for him? Like, we're seeing it. And then once it comes to being on fight night, it just, like, once again, the rest, the rest of history, and I was happy for that, you know, made a good performance. A uh, good title to pick up, and it was a good way to announce myself on TV to the rest of the UK, you know, like to show what I'm really about. And then something else you, you touched upon there, really. I mean, you you touched about like the support of your hometown um, crowd for for one of the one of the fights we were just talking about. And I mean, what does it mean to you, like to be like basically the pride of of Gloucester? I mean, what I mean by that is you must get stopped and like recognised, and you must like, inspire <laughs> people in your community as well. Um, and and you know things like that. I mean, what what does that sort of mean to you? Because you've had a big impact like on your community, I would say. Yeah, yeah, man, like hundred um... percent. Obviously, I, whenever I go out or wherever you go, you get noticed, recognised, and it's it's a weird thing, yeah. Because it's like I remember someone asked about this, like, how's it feel, and da da da, and whatever, and like I wasn't even sound big headed, but I played it down like that's normal. You know what I mean? Like you go out, you can get stopped by like twenty to thirty people. Not stopped, but I mean like you know, there's not a day you're gonna go out, and if you spend enough time out, you're not gonna get noticed or stopped. Hi, da da da, by at least twenty people, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the way I say this, guys, like that's normal. And whatever, but then I had to think uh, later on. I had to think to myself, like, it seems all normal like that, but it wasn't that long ago where that wasn't normal, you know what I mean? Where you would go places, no one didn't know you, no one didn't want to interview you, no one didn't want to speak to you, you weren't fighting on TV and all that. So it's like, you got to appreciate it and 
take it as a good and be grateful for it all, you know? Like, and I am, like, if anything, for my city to be something good to for my, to stand up, like, the, the icon of my city, if I can do that then and draw some hope to some people to show them that you have a bad start or life ain't great or wherever you come from, whatever you do, you can make it. Or even if you're, like, just starting out, like, instead of just thinking, like, so pe people like me, well, where you come from, you can work on TV and you can see anybody who makes it, they make it seem like it's so hard to make it, you know what I mean? Like, it's so hard to make it out the barrel where you're from, whatever, and it really ain't, you know what I mean? As long as you put the hard work and time, dedication in and have a bit of luck, I can't lie, God willing, it'll work out for you, man, and you can, you can do your thing and, you know what I mean, open the doors for your city. So, yeah, that's what I just want to show people that it is possible. And it's not all finished for me anyway. I've still got a long way to still go, but I'm just showing you that you can make a start and scratch the surface at least. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I, I agree. And then, obviously, I mean, we, you know, we've got to touch upon um, Philip Bowles and, and what's happened there, I think, because obviously... Philip Bowles, yeah. Philip yeah, Bowles. and I know that's possibly, you know, going to be a little bit of a, of a thing for you, isn't it? But, I mean, obviously, <laughs> three times, man, I mean, you know, you, you, um, you've you tried to, to fight him and everything. And the first time, I remember seeing it, you know, didn't happen. And I thought, well, obviously, you know, that's boxing, isn't it? And the second time, I thought... Okay, you know, but you were going to be third time lucky, and then obviously COVID and all that. So I, I couldn't believe it, man. So I mean, what are your thoughts on that? How are you sort of staying motivated now with with this situation with Philip Bowles, three cancellations? I mean, what's your thoughts on it? Um, business, isn't it, man? Like we're professionals, so God, just roll with it. It's like uh, I, I was always told, what as a professional, like I'm, what's the definition of a professional? I remember, I kind of want to see it. Where did I see it? It might have been something custom model said to Mike Tyson. He said, ah, what's the definition of a professional? And he said, Mike Tyson said, ah, oh, someone who makes money. Custom model said, it's nothing to do with money. Definitely a professional is someone who can perform at the highest level, no matter what day of the weather, what he's feeding, whatever's going on in his life, he can still perform and grow with it, ups and downs. And that's what it's about. That's, that's life, like, as a whole. Life's full of loads of ups and downs. If you're a true professional, when them ups and downs come, you got to just stay a professional you know so that, that's what I keep on my mind right now so when people are like oh you must be gutted you must be upset you must be no nah, I'm a professional you know like that's, these things happen you know what I mean go with it I might, nothing can't change for me but I still got my shot I still got my position I'm still next in line to be the next one to come through you know what I mean bust through the door so nothing even changed for me when I get my shot I'm going to grab it with both hands so that's irrelevant and like I said to every people like all these people out here will say you should be upset or whatever or, nah you're upset man like there's so much worse things in life and like I'm healthy, my kids healthy, like my family's healthy. So much bad things and stuff going on in the world where I'm okay, man. You know, so I'm grateful for where I'm at, and I thank God for the position I'm in in life. I've still been able to go out there and do the, the sport I love, the thing I love, and help people and do good things. So I'm good. Yeah, I like it really. I like I like the attitude as well. You know, because it's, it's good to hear that it's not sort of getting to you. Do you know what I mean? And just just me, just me saying that now, man, because <laughs> I, well, I'm just glad to hear that. That's all. <laughs> and something else you something else you touched on there about gratitude and about like faith and stuff like that. I mean, as I understand it, and I, and I remember we talked about this before when I interviewed you before. But your you know your faith is something that's important in your life, isn't it? It's something that's. Um, can, can we touch upon that a little bit? I mean, what part does does like faith sort of play in your life? Yeah, faith like the whole part of my life. Like like to that to that extent, it's the whole part of my life. Like you know, like I was brought up. Um, like as a kid like around church and stuff like that you know what I mean so that's always been a big part of my life no matter which part of down, down life I've like diverged and gone down um, I'm a real shame I've always kept God and religious stuff like that close to my heart and um, for me um, I don't know man like I owe everything to God I believe because anytime I've done good bad whatever it's always God was um, kept me good and come through and everything what got good in my life it's I have to say from God so um no nah, man, I just give thanks, man. That's that's it. That's I'm just a grateful person, like you know. What I mean, I ain't one of these people was the biggest religious this and that. God preaching, God fearing, but I ain't that. But I'm just grateful for what God has done for me, you know. It's like, and that's that's really it. No, I like it, man. I just you know, it's it's a good thing to see because you know, with gratitude, um, because you do see so many fighters these days complaining and they want and they want, whereas you're like enjoying the process. And I just I like that. I like that outlook on it. So the other thing, I mean, obviously Philip Bowes, and, and I know that that fight's now going to be rebooked and you've got to um, sort of work towards that. Are you sort of thinking about like steps beyond that now or are you just sort of taking it, are you just concentrating on that fight or are you still thinking of like further ahead? Do you know what I mean? It's a weird thing, you know, because like I said, I'm a professional, yeah. So in the same time, I'm like, 
nah, man, I don't even look past Philip Bowles. My mind always, any fight I'm fighting, I always keep my mind on that fight. I never look past them to the jobs and whatever. For this instance, though, I can't lie yet. To keep myself interested, yeah, I'm a bit bored of this Philip Bowles piece. I had to look at everything thinking, you know what? Hmm, what comes next? Who be better? I'll beat that guy up. I'll beat that guy. I can beat that guy. You know what I mean? So, to me, just keep, just keep my mind just at ease for fun just fun of it like you know what i mean like i create little fantasy fights in my head like or target little things what i'm gonna do after i beat philip but deep down my mind is on philip you know what i mean like um i'm thinking of them titles uh when i'm training i'm thinking about what i'm gonna do to him them like our game plans on him everything's still as it is like the talks about us fighting in the summer you know what i mean behind closed doors it'd be a bit different I'm, like i like fighting with the crowd there the fans i like the energy but I'm a professional, so it don't matter, you know what I mean? It just has to be just business, you know? But, um, yeah, nah, man, my mind's on Philip, so I'm not really looking too much past him, but at the same time, you got to look, like, you, you'd be hard to, you'd be a fool not to think of what coming next when there's so much op- opportunities and options after, you know what I mean? Like, like you beat Philip, get the British and Commonwealth, you've got so many routes, you've got the British route you want to go down, you want to stay around the British, defend the British Commonwealth, do you want to move on to European, do you want to go down the international route, do you want to take someone for a world ranking, get a world eliminator, you know what I mean, there's so much routes to go down, it just depends what the best, the best route really, the best options, um, make the best money and gets me the, the best way, but as long as it all gets me to a world title and an end, that's the end goal, then I don't really mind, um, but Philip Bowles is just like a one little step, step like a little part in the plan Gotta get past to get to the next part, but for some reason, we're still on the same part, you know. Like, we should have been off this British part onto the next long time ago, but that's just how it goes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's good. I mean, the mentality is good because obviously, I know that obviously there's been some inactivity with this, and so it's good that you, you know, you're keeping, keeping a goal in mind. You touched on something else there, really. You touched on, on crowds and, and things like that, and obviously, at the moment, crowds are sort of you know out the window until this is over. But looking back, I mean, what are some of the best crowds you fought in front of? Was the hometown crowd the best, or was there like another one? Um, it would have to be, yeah, uh, the two I top it with, yeah, like I crowds wise, it's gonna have to be. It's weird, yeah. Yeah, crowds-wise, I'd have to be Chris Jenkins fight Gloucester. You know what I mean? Like, ain't no better. That was no better. Like, you got to think this year. I always say it. There's no better crowd. And I hold my words. There's no better crowd than Gloucester. You're never going to find a better crowd. And when I say that, it's not even, oh, I can Gloucester better crowd. I mean, like, I can go anywhere, like, anywhere, and you'll have, like, between 150 to 200, maybe more, depending on what fight it is, yeah, of people will travel far. Like, went to Sunderland, we brought, like, 150. Fighted, um, Freddie Craig bought, like, 150 in London. Like, you know what I mean? Always were bringing between them numbers, you know what I mean, yeah? So, the, the noise they make, the, the, the energy they bring, yeah, like, they're drowned out. You could go to someone else's hometown, where you brought 150 people, and they got, like, 600, X amount, how many hometowns, and they're drowned out them, and their energy, and their mate, they're quiet, them, and it's so much, yeah? So, to have that same type of people, where I say Gloss are the best crowd ever, but be in the hometown where you got the same energy, but 2,000 of them, now the whole place full of them. Bro, it's not even mad. Like, that, that, that stuff will spray your life like there's no tomorrow. But then, coming for atmosphere, I would have to say, yeah, it's weird. My first time fighting in your call, when I fight Freddie Kewitt, the atmosphere was a bit mad still. Like, it was good, because it was the type of thing, like, when you're coming out, you know, you already know how you're called set out. Like, it's all set out. They're all above you. It's all closed in. The energy's mad. And it's just like a... I liked it because I felt like I was in, like, a lion's den. Like, it didn't matter what year. It was like, you're here. You've got your crowd there, whatever. But I think I went up to, like, about 150 up there. But it was, like, all of the other people, like, London or whatever. But it was good because it's like, you're in a lion's den. It's like, make or break here. Are you ready for this? You know what I mean? And I like that type of serious, scary feel to, like, you know what I mean? That real feel, like, this is real, you know? Like, you better handle it. Because all you got to think from before then. All your fights were small halls type of you're ready, you're, you're going to win type of against journeyman type of people. But this is like the first 50-50, not even 50-50, this is where you're meant to lose against 11-0 guy who's beat, like knocked out six fighters where you've only had six fights. So it's kind of like, um, I like that atmosphere. That atmosphere is good. But they're my two kind of, out of just the home, sh- the home show or Freddie Kewitt, your cool fight. Them two atmospheres are kind of mad still, yeah. And something else I was going to ask you really is, is obviously, we haven't really touched on like your training and stuff. I mean, we, we've only touched on it a little bit. But I mean, um, first things first, I mean, how, how are you training in lockdown? And I mean, with all this stuff going on with COVID, I mean, what's, so, what's the score with that? I mean, how are you making that work at the moment? Yeah, man, it's going good. Um, obviously, still uh, training, whatever. JP, my coach, John Pittman, I mean, um, he's basically... 
where the gym's his business, whatever. So he got access to him whenever, you know what I mean? So he's basically, he shut the gym, it shut to the public, like, you know what I mean? But me and the fighters, like the actual fighters what are, got careers progressing, they can use gym whenever. I got the key to the gym so I can go whenever, you know what I mean? Um, on my own, whatever. So it's that type of thing. And I think it's just a case of keep going, ticking over. If you got a date, like I've, obviously I've got to be, it's, I'm a bit different to the rest of the fighters because I know I'm going to be one of the, as soon as lockdown gets lifted or whatever, or even behind closed doors, I'm going to be one of the first fights back. So I got to kind of stay ready, stay on it a bit more than the rest of the fighters. But it's just a type of thing that you're taking over, going with it. I mean, just keeping it fun. But the minute you get like a little hint, the boom, you step on it. But we know, we, we, we know July, August, everything goes to plan, everything goes good, then we'll be showtime. You know what I mean? So we've got to be ready by then. So that type of thing keep the weight down keep fit somehow get sparring in without catching covid i don't know like it's a bit mad like with this new world i don't know how it's gonna go but it will run and in the end it'll be successful isn't it? yeah and obviously the professional side of that still you know still comes into it with the, with the mentality and i mean something else here really is um you know with well you probably get asked this a lot but it's, it's something i still want to ask anyway i mean i know with your fighting career like we haven't seen the best of you yet i mean i know that because i know obviously there's a there's a lot more but i mean <laughs> so far like what would you say is like being your toughest fight like where you've had to like dig deep and um stuff like that man i mean you probably get asked that a lot but i still think this is a good one because do you think you do you think in, in the fights you've had yet you've been really tested or do you think that's like still to come do you know what i mean Nah, like I've been, I've, it's weird, yeah, because I can never say what fight is my hardest fight because it's the type of thing like um, every fight, I, I'm not, I've said to people before, every fight brings their own like challenges and different things. And every fight is a learning fight in their own way. Like every fight I've gone into and I've come out of it and I've learned something different. I've become a better fighter in that way. I'm more experienced. Um, you know what I mean? So many things. Uh, testing. I think I've been tested. Ah, I've been testing every fight in their own way again. Like, I mean, sometimes I've been tested and to the crowd, they might think, yo, you breezed that fight. It looks easy. But they don't know, like, I've been tested. That, that fight looked easy because how hard I worked for that fight, you know what I mean? Or whatever, or how hard, how easy I made that fight look. But then it was a case of, the ones that stick out to me are like, obviously you got the main of my six hard fights that stick out. But then out of them, it's like, well, I can remember, it's like, they're all different. They're all different. Like, Freddie Kewitt was testing in his own way because it was the first time stepping up going into the Lions then you know I mean against a guy where you're practically he's a dangerous opponent what can knock you out of any punch and you're practically going to lose that was a test in his own way uh, Glenn Foot was tough in the way where you got a fighter what like the, the talk they were talking about this guy all the, the stuff I was hearing about this Glenn Foot guy before I got in this fight like he's so dirty he's so just aggressive he's so animal he's so the beast he's, you know what I mean all these things you're hearing so it's all of that to get into the ring with it and it's like he lived up to all of that you know what I mean I can't lie like don't get me wrong you watch the fight, the, the fight was, you know, just because how easy I made it look, but Glenn was a bit of a challenge. I can't lie, he was on you, you know what I mean? So that was challenging his own way, where I was like, you know what I mean, a guy on you aggressive from the start of the fight to the last round, but it was like, it was good because I showed how I could make a guy like that look so normal, you know what I mean? And then after that, for him to go on to do what he'd done. Um, I don't know, Chris Jenkins, um, Chris Jenkins for me, is going to probably be the one what stands out the most to me, only because it was like, not that I didn't know, like, I knew that was like a make or break fight. It was in front of your hometown, so you got the added pressure of that. But what what brings it to life? But it was like that first round of that Chris Jenkins fight. It was like I didn't know what to suspect. You know what I mean? I didn't really know enough. But I know Chris, every time Chris Jenkins is good, but then it's like he hasn't. In my head, it's like he hasn't gone on to do what he's supposed to be done. Like you know, like how he's done what he's done now. Like he's British Commonwealth champion. In my head, it's like at the time, I'm thinking if he's as good as he's been, why he done that stuff? You know what I mean? Like if he's as amazing as it. But it's like I know he's good because his record was like. I think he lost two at the time, man. Both of them fights were, like, controversial, what he lost. So, he technically, to me, he was, like, still undefeated. Um, he's, like, at the time, I think I was only 10 fights. He had, like, 20 fights, whatever. Um, uh, like, he was a good fight. And the first round of that fight, when, like I said, when I went in that first round, it's like, I didn't know what to suspect. I remember that going out, thinking, all right, cool. Let's go with the flow. He didn't even give me time to go with the flow. Like, he was on me, like, you know what I mean? He was straight on me, boom. I was thinking, whoa. That first round, I remember going back, sitting down on my stool, thinking, you know, you know, you just have to take a breath, thinking, what the heck just happened there? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that was a bit weird. Talking to my, co my team, my coach, my coach, like, this is what it's about. You know what I mean? This is what it's about. You ready for this? Cool. And I'm thinking, you know what? Yeah. And right then, then on the spot, like, on the chair, sat there. It was like, you know where some of the people, you know, if you make a break, like, you think yourself, nah. Like, a lot of people feel like, nah. When they get hit with that, like, their adrenaline, all of that, they're thinking, nah, I'm not ready for it. the crowd, all of that. You know what I mean? They didn't have the best first round. A lot of people that broke broken right down the spot, thought, nah, nah, it's not for me, it crumbled. 
But for me, it was like, that was making me, for me, it's like, I remember gritting back on my gut saying, yeah, like, all right, cool. Like, I'm ready. Like, let me go show everybody what I'm really about. Like, good. We've got a fight on our hands. We've got a fight where I'm not going to look like I'm going to have it all my own way. You know what I mean? I'm not going to look like I'm so, like, spectacular. But let's see if I can still do that, come out the best. And to what I did, like, the way the performance went, the fight was so good after, and, like, everybody had a good time, watched the fight, whatever, and it was a good fight. And Chris Jenkins, I, like, I, a lot of respect for him because he brought a lot out of me, showed me a lot in that fight. I say that is the most. Um, one of the best fights. I see that was one of the, like the most remembrance fight. If I can use that word, most remembrance fight for everything what added up into it and what I took the most from it. So that was the best one. But they all had their own things, man. You know what I mean? Like um, Dar Foley, Bill Ray, man. He had his own challenges. Every fight had their own thing. Even all down to like fighting journeyman. I remember Chris Adderley. Like Chris Adderley probably, Chris Adderley probably gave him my hardest test in a, in a fight. And that's so mad. That was a journeyman, and it wasn't so much of the case of. Uh, no, like, not that he's better than all them other fighters, but he's not worse than many of them fighters neither. Like, Chris Adam is a good fighter. If you're not on your game, he can give you a hard night. It would work, you know what I mean? And I remember a time when I was meant to fight Chris Adderway, and then um, we meant to fight him. Uh, my first time fighting a whole shot, meant to fight him, but the fight fell through, whatever. And I was, I was up for the fight. I remember he beat one of my, um, a guy in my gym. No, the first time we've been to fight in a home show in Gloucester, I was on the undercard. Chris Adderway fighted Andy Harris. He beat Andy Harris. This, we we're going to get another home show on. I said, I want to fight Andy Harris. You know what I mean? Everything, uh, not Andy Harris, Chris Hadaway. Everything Chris Hadaway beat Andy Harris, so it would be a good little thing for me to come through and fight him, you know what I mean? And get a bit of revenge for Andy Harris. The fight fell through. So eventually, got on a couple of months later. But when the fight fell through, it's like I was trained up, I was ready for the fight, whatever, you know, I'm ready to go. The fight fell through. Um, a couple of things happened through the year after the fight fell through. A couple of months later, obviously, my friend passed away. Um, so I wasn't really in the gym as much, like training or whatever. I weren't, my mind was not on boxing. But at the same time, it's like, um, my manager at the time saying, like, you still got to fight, you got to fight. You know what I mean, they want me to get me out there at the time. Like, I'm kind of like a good, I, I, my profile is building where I'm becoming a big ticket seller. So I was like, cool, just get me fights and whatever. So I remember I fighting Chris, um, no, I fighted Christian Lee. I didn't really train for that fight neither. I fighted for him. And then I had a back-to-back -back fight with Chris Adderway. I trained like I trained for that fight, but I wasn't. I didn't train to a proper camp for Chris Adway. You know what I mean? Went into the fight. I'm gonna be in, in the change room, and then um, no, went for went for food. I went for food. You know what I mean? Weighed in. Went for food. Had a Nando's. Came back to the change room. Trained it like warming up. And next minute, I didn't feel right. I was thinking, hey, I was warming up. You know, my belly had a little twinge. I was thinking, hey, I was like to John. Wait a second, John. Ran to the toilet. Blah. Threw up all my like food. I was thinking what like. But in the time, when, they, when we came back from the food, they liked to us, we only got like an hour and we're on. But normally you never have that on a show, like, you know what I mean? Like, you never have that. You have like a bit of time to like rehydrate, whatever. We didn't get nothing like that. So I was thinking, A, so I had to go into the fight a bit hungry. Like, it was like, yeah, time to walk. I was walking to the ring. I just felt empty. You know, you feel so drained, like nothing can you, you know what I mean? In the ring, in the fight, I remember just like fighting him. And it's like, I say that had to be my hardest fight because I had to put so much into it to not lose. Because if I didn't put everything in it, that guy, would, Chris, Chris Adam would have beat me right there on the spot. You know what I mean? Like he would have beat me and um, that would have been the end of my reign, you know? But I had to put so much into it. And I said, that showed me a lot. But after that fight, I was like, I never, ever come in underprepared again. And ever since then, like that made me be a bit more added to my experience of becoming more professional. Because like, I never want to feel like that again in a fight. Like so drained under, like not having enough time to be rehydrated where you haven't eaten before or stuff like that. Not feeling okay mentally before like stuff going in your personal life. There's so much stuff that showed me. So for me in that fight, that got to be my most testing. And I know I had to drag that one out, but I had to kind of give you a little summary of it all for you to get an understanding really. But yeah, man, you know what I mean? But they're, all, they're all challenged in their own ways. And, and I said they made me be the fight I am today. So yeah, man. Do you know what's interesting about that, though, is it gives a different insight into it, man, because it's like you see a fight like that against Chris Adwin, you sort of think, obviously, because he's a journeyman, I know there's no easy fights, but you sort of think, yeah. oh, you really, you just, you just breeze through that one. And so it's interesting to see it, like, like to hear about it, like, from that point of view, do you know what I mean? Because you, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. like behind the scenes, isn't it? And something else that I was going to bring up, talking about toughest, you know, this, that and the other. I mean, what about sparring now? I mean, what are, what are some of your best spars? Because I've, in the past, obviously, I've seen you sparring, um, you know, seen some, some very, very good sparring and stuff like that. I mean, what would you say have been some of your, like, your best spars, like some of your most memorable ones or whatever? Um, in memorable way, like, the ones, like, where I'm, like, I do my best or where I learned, like, like the most from it or have the best like just the best remembrance as far as you yeah know. Just, i don't mind like i just just the ones that stand out to you really i mean if there's any that stick in your mind it's like that was something yeah. special good bad whatever you know is there any that stand out or are they all just blend together a bit no nah, they were like sparring's a bit like the fighting as well yeah because like 
people ask me a lot, like, who's the best person you spot? Who's giving you your hardest spot? Like that. And even that, yeah, I can never really pinpoint an answer because they're all challenges that own way, you know what I mean? Like, everybody yeah. brings yeah. different things to the table. Especially at the same time, it's like, you might go one day against an elite fighter, have a hard spar against him. You might go on the second day and you might give him the hard spar, you know what I mean? So it's never really, like, straightforward like that. But um, I would have sparred, like, you got to remember, I've sparred so many top fighters from, like, Linares, Joe, Joe Codina, Conor Ben, uh, Hara Davis, uh, Lee Salby. Um, I don't know, there's just so many fighters, Martin J. Wood, uh, so many top-level fighters out there um, that I sparred, Josh Taylor, Luke Campbell, you know what I mean? All of them. So it's, like, it's hard to, like, pinpoint who, you know what I mean? But they all do think that like, you all learn different things from them all in their own way. But then I say, like, for me, I say, Joe Cordina stands out a lot to me. I've always said, I said before, like, you know what I mean? One of them stands out a lot to me because it's, like, for a young fighter, he, like, he reminds me a lot of myself, but with young fighters coming through. And he obviously, he's a different, I've done it the harder way where I've lo- um, been no big promoter or whatever, but he's had it. And not saying harder way like that, I mean, like, we've all done it hard, but I mean, he's done it the glamorous harder way. He's had the Olympics, everything like that and learn to trade that way. I've learned the other way. But it's like, we're still both young fighters coming through and with so much bags of pot- potential. And that's what I'm saying. That's what I like about Joe Cardina. Because when I'm in the ring with him, like, when you're in the ring with a lot of fighters, it don't matter if someone gives you good spar or whatever, you can see where they're at in their career where you see if they've got a lot more to give or whatnot. But with Joe, when I'm with him, he's like, a lot like me, you can see like, we've only just touched the scratch the surface is what we can show you, you know what I mean? So that's why I like sparring with people like him. Um, Josh Taylor, Luke Campbell, like, they give me, like, good spots. I learned a lot from them. Linares, like, they're spar- spars I remember. Linares was a good spar because I liked, I liked, what I liked about Linares was, like, you go from, like, a stack position to, like, such a speedy energy burst of, like, five punch combination in such a short space. So, it's like, when I was in with him, it's like, I said, I like that. I like how he did that. I said, I can do that quicker, you know? I said, I'm going away and I'm going to learn how to do that quicker, like, literally from just being still, just like five punches in a space of like two seconds, you know what I mean? Like type of thing. I thought I can do that. So next time I see him, I'll do that better. And so there's little things like that, you know what I mean? Like where you you're going around, traveling all over the place, and just learning and you know what I mean, pinpointing and taking things from them. And what people got to remember is like I've had I have i have had a lot more harder spars when I've had fights because I'm learning my trade. That's how I've been starting to learn my trade. Like a lot of these people have had the glamorous uh, elite amateur career, whatever, gone to Olympics, done all these things, been on GB. I ain't had a chance to do it that way. I had a short amateur career, like two seasons. Very well in the amateur fight, so I've had that many fights in a short space of time. I turned pro at 19, and it's like kind of jumping straight from from uh, five fights into like uh, journeyman fight, the English title fight. Kind of like you know, what I mean, a bit of a rush. So it's like we had to kind of learn the trade and catch up a bit. So it's like, how can we do that? Just get the sparring. You know what I mean, get world level sparring. And it's like, if you can do good against a world champion, what can stop you? Like, what what? Why can you not do good against a drop back down to British level? You know what I mean, European level, like stuff like that. Like that's how I look at it. You know what I mean? So. Um, and like I say, you, you've been there. You see me like spar with Lee Savage for like world champion. It's like if you see what we do, we how we mix it like that. And if you any fight will come from a low level like British up into world level sparring with Lee Sabi, drop right down to British level, you're gonna clean up easy, you know. Like so, that's why I look at it, just do the match, you know. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I I like the mentality because it's like they say, you know, in order to be the best, you've got to fight the best. But it's a little different because you're applying it to sparring. But you've got to surround yourself with the. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Fun. And that's the other thing, really, James. I mean, you know, you've got like a really good team around you as well, um, which which is something that I've seen. That obviously, I've seen that make a difference to a lot of fighters where they do or don't have like a good team around them. Obviously, can, can be make or break as well. Um, yeah. I mean, what's it like working with your team? In I mean, in general, obviously, with John Pitbull and with with everyone else with MTK. I mean, just give us a little bit of um, like an overview of of the support you get, if that makes sense. Yeah, man, it's great. Like, I feel like, I feel like, truth is, I'm blessed. Like, I feel like I'm really blessed, really lucky. And this is one of the things I say, like, when I say my big thanks to God, and for that, when I say to you, and people get, oh, why, why? It's because look at certain people, look at certain fighters, like, like, I'm blessed and lucky to have the team and the people I've got around me. I don't say that, like, it's such a cliche to say that, like, everybody can say that and just say, oh, I'm so bad. But I really believe it because you're lucky because John Pittman, you know what I mean, from being a young 40 year old kid, like, he's kind of took me under his wing and we've been close, and you know what I mean, and you got to think it's hard to find loyalty in the sport. That's the main thing in it, you know what I mean? Loyalty in it. So that's why I say I want to become blessed to have a coach where it ain't no break as we're, we're close, you know what I mean? We're like, we're in this to the end. And, you know what I mean? He put he puts in as much as I put in, you know what I mean? He wants as bad as I want this. So you don't really find that in, like, teams like this. So that's great. MTK, like, going from joining MTK to them, basically, I don't know, like, I don't really see management teams like MTK where 
their they got the kind of the branding, the clout they got, the, the people's the respect. So much people talking good things about them, and where they back it up, you know what I mean? Where they want to go the extra mile for the fighters, where they want to do good things for the fighters. Where if they said, "All right, we'll get your title shot on that fight," they want to go back up so that backs up their clout. You know what I mean, add to their respect, their name, like things like that. It's good, you know what I mean? So having a team like them and not just that, it's like having MTK where the position they're in now, you know what I mean? So they're in a position now where they can break through and give people big opportunities. So I'm lucky in that aspect as well. The whole of my team, Scott, um, Scott Gibbon, nice guy, man. He's my um, coach and I'm coaching my gym, Fight Factory. He does great things, you know what I mean? Um, he works, he's got his own business, but every day after he finishes work, he's giving off his time coming out to the gym, training the rest of the pro fighters, the ever fighters, taking an amateur class, training me, stuff like that, you know what I mean? Um, I ain't getting paid for that to do that, you know what I mean? But he's coming out and doing that out of his free will, you know what I mean? I don't know no one with a bigger heart than that guy, you know what I mean? Like, such a sound guy, and I've got a lot of time for my guy. Um, Tony Borg, Billy Billy Reynolds, you know what I mean? Uh, you know Tony Borg, come on, you know Tony Borg, Billy, you know them, they're your guys as well, you know? Like, you already know straight away, like, have them at addition to my team, you know what I mean? Like, it's such a big thing, and, like, such so grateful to have them aboard of it, and... I think we would, we've been working with Tony Borg and Deb, uh, Billy Reynolds ten come down to two St. Joe's since like, I think I said I was like 17, 18, you know what I mean? I said I was amateur. Back then, like John would take me down the spar with Mitchell Buckling, uh, Salby, all that, you know what I mean? So from back then, we was always going up and down there. But at the same time, we were traveling all over the place, whatever, training with loads of different um, fighters and in different gyms, whatever. But it was like Tony Borg, St. Joe's, it's like about that place, it always like kind of stuck with me, you know what I mean? So where we were traveling all over the place, it got to run about... It might have been a Chris Jenkins fight. It got to run about that fight, and it was like, and you need you, know, you need something else to add to the team. I was like, we're going to the next level. Where can we add that bit more experience? You know what I mean? Like, we need something to fast track us a bit more to get that bit more experience. And I was thinking, there's loads of coaches we could have went and worked with. Loads of coaches we could have added to, like our team. But it was like Tony Borg was the right one. It was like he was the right book because like at the same time as the knowledge he's got, the experience he's got, the the good coach he is, him working with Sabu, all them stuff. Is the fact of and even knowing him, the fact for me, what stuck home, what won it was, like, i have grown with him technically, you know what I mean? Like, from being a seven-year-old kid, he, a lot of everybody in my team, they've all grown with me, you know what I mean? They've all been there with me from a young kid, so it don't get no better than that. No one ain't changed, no one ain't changing, no one ain't showed me nothing different, I don't need to know, and that showed me I know everything I need to know about everybody, and there's loyalty in there, you know what I mean? So, from, um, like, knowing Tony from back then, yeah, I'm changing, Tony's the soundest guy, nice guy, so I said, Tony, come on board, jump on the board of the team, and then it, I needed a cut man as well. So, like, Benny Reynolds, best, like, you know what? It's funny because Benny Reynolds, he he, promote, he come to me, he he auditioned himself to me as he's the best cut man around. You know what I mean? I was like, yeah, okay, cool. You know what I mean? At the time, I just thought, yeah, cool, let's get it on. Got a cut man in. I can't lie, like, Benny Reynolds backs up his word. He's like the best. There ain't no better cut man than Billy Reynolds. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, like, someone showed me a better cut man than him because like, I've seen him do some mad cuts, bro. Like, there's been some mad cuts he's worked on. Yeah, stop, like, where fights would have been stopped, fights over, whatever. Billy Reynolds handled that, you know what I mean? So for me, it was like, you know what, yeah, you get the place on the team. And, and when I step back and I actually look at my team and whatever, and not even just that, like, loads of sponsored, sponsors I got on them, I even go through them after, you know what I mean? Like, sponsored local businesses were stuck with me from amateurs to now. When I step back and look at my team, it's like mad, bro, you know what I mean? Like, I got a good team around me, I got a good PR guy, Matt, everybody, you know what I mean? It's, it's good. And I believe, like, that's why I always said to people, I'm grateful and I am blessed because. This stuff doesn't happen out of luck, like, well, I say I'm lucky, but I don't think it happens out of luck. I believe things happen for a reason, and maybe God's reason to put all these good people around me. So, and with a good team around you, nothing bad shouldn't really happen, and it's also only the top we're going, isn't it? I mean, obviously, you've stayed dedicated all this time so far, and I know, obviously, you've still got some very big fights ahead of you. But, I mean, fundamental now, right, your motivation, your motivation for boxing, and I know you want to be world champion, but, I mean, what drives you? Because, obviously, for some guys, it's, like, fame. Or for some guys, it's money. And for other guys, it's, like, their families or whatever. Um, do you know what I mean? It's like you speak to fighters and it's, it's, it's all different different things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for you, like, what, what would you say is, like, the number one thing? Is it just to be the best? Or, like, or, I mean, what, what drives you every day, man? It's weird, man. It's weird because, like, I, I, I always say that same thing. Like, you have to have a why. What is your driver? Everybody, everybody has to have a why. Without a why, you can't. No one can get up, and anybody who's done anything great, they have to have a way because it can't be done, you know. Like, what drives you, what gets you up, all them type of things, like, all them questions. I always ask myself, and I always ask myself, What is my why? But then for me, it's weird because, like, I can never really come up with one, you know what I mean? Like, I never come up with one why. I got so many why's, like you say, like, like your family, like, be the best, do this and that, like, help people. There's all these main why's that come up to me, and they all add into getting me up in the morning, make me 
go do them runs, uh, eating clean, um, when it gets hard, you know what I mean, doing an extra round, whatever. But, like, before all of that, like, the, the best way to look ask the question is, like, before having a family, before having an understanding all these things, before understanding about fame, having a name and all that type of thing, what drove me then to really want to get to the position now? And for me, it was a case of my number one why what I started, ever started with when I first walked into the game was, it was to be the best, but not just to be the best, like to be the best, like I'm the best, but to be known as the best, like go down as the best, like be no. And it, and the, the way you got to say that is like, I want to go down in history as number one. Like when it's all said and done, when it's all over, it's like that guy is known for being the best. He did this, 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 this. That's why when I go out and have fights, I don't pick them easy fights. I pick the hard fights that I can remember, the fights where I can go down as he did that. You know what I mean? Them fights will leave a bit of a excitement to it, you know? Like I like a challenge and because if no one can't do what I'm doing, then I've got to be the best, you know? So that's how I like push myself to extra mile. And it's always been my thing. Like, that's always been my thing to know if I'm the best. And um, when I'm sparring with these guys, I mean, all these people I'm sparring, same thing. It's like, do you down to know, all right, if I go spar with a Josh Taylor, at least I'll be at world level. But I'm dropping my line. It's like in my head, secretly, while I'm still training, working at British level, I know subconsciously I can mix it at world level. You know what I mean? I'm okay to be at world level. How far can I go? I just want to know. I'm intrigued. So that's what it's for me. It's a bit of excitement, a bit of wanting to know, like, how far can I go? And I don't know. Yeah, it's, more, it's mainly that, literally that. It's been that. How far to go? How far can I go? Because before you know, I'm maybe not the best, but I'll be happy with knowing where I'm at. I just want to know. I don't know if I'm the best. I don't know if I'm down there or up there. But I'm starting, as we keep going along, taking these hard fights, sparring this start to become a bit more clear that, you know what, maybe you could go all the way. So let's see, you know, let's see. Advice for, you know, for young boxers. I mean, it's something I touched on earlier, but um, people coming into the sport now, or, or maybe not even boxing specifically, but just people who want to like achieve in life and, you know, do well in life and, and things like that or anything like that. I mean, what would you, like, what advice would you give to them, basically? Work hard. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the one thing I can say is work hard. And I, and that's such a cliche to say itself. Like, when I first started out, some people said to me, work hard, work hard. What have I, I'm, I'm about to met so many bosses. What can you give me to turn up? Work hard, work hard. Every month you work. I think, what the heck, bro? Like, we know that. Like, that's so, but it actually is literally true. Like, you know what? Like, anytime I've, anything I've done actually great, like, in the sport, I mean, like, my biggest achievements, they've only come when I've actually put the work in, like, really hard. I have really, gone an extra mile, you know what I mean? Like when you feel like you when you feel like you're working hard and you feel like nah I could do more, then more or you're still pushing yourself, you find more to do. Like that's 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 what it's about. Like literally work nothing beats hard work and it don't matter how talented you are. I said like I believe I'm a talented fighter. If I don't work hard, the guy what does work hard, don't matter how talented he can come beat me, you know what I mean? So I would say but how good can you be if talent and work and working hard mix it together, you know? So that's the best advice I can really give to any starting out. But the ever for any fighter what wants to actually succeed and actually want to try to be the best and that's their goal not just to be a boxer to start now but wants to they got it in their mind like a bit crazy like i would before that they can go all the way and want to be the best the best advice i can give them is it's not going to be easy and you're going to have loads of ups and downs journey like journey is not going to be easy at all like it might sound all glamorous now but it's not it's going to be ups and downs with anything in life where you're trying to succeed and be the best in but just stick with it because once you, like, you know what I mean? Once you get through them trials, tribulations, like, definitely going to be worth it, you know what I mean? But, like I say, definitely not going to be easy. But then when them hard times hit, just don't let it beat you. That's what I can say, man. Literally, don't let it beat you. It's not the end of the world. Like, that's the best advice I can give. Hard times hit, it's not the end of the world. Roll with it. Good times are coming. Sunny days. Yeah. Word. <laughs> Good advice, man. I like it, man. I like it. I mean, really, that's everything, man. I mean, we, you know, we've covered some absolutely, some awesome stuff in there, man. The one thing I would like to say to you, though, is before we, you know, before we wrap this up, is there anything you'd like to say, like, in particular, any, anything at all, or, like, are you all good? All I want to say is, uh, I don't know, still here, we still do nothing, still working hard, still the best fighter out here. Once it's all locked down, clears up, whatever, I'm going to get the opportunity to prove I'm the best fighter out here, and I can't wait to prove it to the world. Um, I'm hungry to prove it to the world, you know what I mean? My time's coming, I'm ready to prove it to the world. But summer times all goes good, July, August, behind closed doors, it don't matter. Make sure everybody tunes in, it's going to be one of the best fights you're ever going to witness. And but it's going to come back on a bang and I'm ready to lead the way. Well, I, I appreciate you um, taking the time to have a chat with me, like in all fairness. I really do appreciate it. Um, covered some absolutely fantastic stuff and, and it's been a really good insight like into 
your career into your mindset into like where you're going where you've come from yeah, like, yeah. So, so much stuff so much good stuff man it's like much better than what i thought again like i knew it would be good so it's good to have a chat with you man you know what i mean anytime you know what i mean give me a shout don't don't get too big in the world for me man liam get me Still no never <laughs> never <laughs> no you're a top man really you are yeah honestly yeah no yeah but i do appreciate it though man it's it, like i say it's, it's nice but i'm just i'm just me do you know what i mean even though i'm yeah. like working, working up and stuff it's the same same as you man like professional you know, that's what it, that's what it, that's what i like about you you know what i mean liam that's what i do appreciate about you because it's like you're you're exactly like me. You're grateful for where you're at. You, you're never gonna you you're, you're gonna be a guy. What will stay the same? No matter if someone goes gives you everything you want out of life, what you're trying to gain to, you're gonna stay the same because you see that in you. Because it's like you're grateful and you love what you're doing. Just to be able to do it, you don't even care if you get paid. No matter if you're on the biggest stage, just to do what you do, you love every minute of it, and that enough is payment for you. So people like you, you're gonna succeed all the way, my brother. Like trust me, like and like that's why I say you're a big. Believer. I believe you're a big believer, and you you'll get the world to you because you're grateful for every aspect of what comes in you, and you're happy for it. And that's what it's about, man. Like too many people in life, yeah, they could have the world and not grateful enough for it. You know, I mean, there's so many people out there who ain't got even an ounce what we could have, you know. But it's like people who are grateful. I feel like they're there, succeed the most, and like life rewarding the most, you know. So keep doing your thing, man, Liam, and keep being grateful, man, and keep oh, doing your thing. Oh, good, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. And all I can say to that is, like, right back at you, man. I mean, you know, you, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You put that much better than, yeah, I feel the same the same about you, man, because that's the thing, though, isn't it? It's like the, the, the true riches are, are in here. Do you know what I mean? Trust me, like, bro. That's, that's, that's it, man. Yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> people forget that. A lot of people true. forget that. And even this isolation, I think that is a bit of a reminder. I think this is why everybody needs a bit of this isolation, because it reminds everybody what, like, the true meaning of life is and what you got to be happy with and what you're grateful about, you know? So it's reminded me a lot anyway about life and I can't wait to get a kickback start on life because I know I'm going to give everything, everything all, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Really put it in perspective for people, I think, man. It's, it's really like what, like, reminding people what's important, giving people time to think about stuff, like That's what it. matters and just, yeah, man, I, th I think a lot of good, like a lot of good things will come out of it in the long run, do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. even though it's hard and people have lost jobs and this and that, I think in the long run, it's, it's put things back in perspective, like stop taking things for granted for people and all that type of stuff, man. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> On the same page, yeah, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.